Thank you to the University of Southampton for inviting me to give the 27th Gregory Lecture. I'm truly honored. Today, uh, in the lecture, I'm going to cover two things. One is the very grand challenge of how climate change interacts with our food system, both globally, nationally, regionally, at all, across scales. The second topic I want to um, share with you is a bit more about AGMIP that Justin, um, that Justin just uh, described. It stands for the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project. The I stands for two things, because we can't just be on and on modeling and modeling and modeling, right, and intercomparing, unless we then utilize what we've learned and really work on improving our models so they, they can do a better job. There's been disruption in the climate change and agriculture field for many, many years. There were, and I know because I did a lot of the work, especially you know, through the years, uh, through those years, climate change work on, on uh, food was focused really exclusively on agricultural production. Now we're having a disruption in our field, and it's, we, it is expanding to, when we think about climate change, that we need to think about not just the production, which of course still is very important, but we have to think about the food system as a much greater whole. So the grand challenge, as I said, is climate change in food. What does it mean? Food is tremendously important for climate change. First, because it is a recipient of the impacts of climate change. How will our food zones change, where will food grow, what will productivity be, what will the nutrition of our crops be, for example, and livestock. But at the same time, agriculture itself and the food system itself emits greenhouse gases. So it is through the, through the, through the ruminants, methane production, et cetera. So it is this tremendously fundamental sector when we think about climate change. Almost the sort of the, the it's like a kind of poster child for, for, for what, how, why climate change is important. So what this first schematic is showing is first of all the climate system and then the food system that fits within it. So as I said, probably 99%, I would say, of the research on climate change and food so far has focused on production and supply. But now we're really expanding our understanding to say we've got to look at what's going on with the supply chains, what's going on with markets, what's going on with trade. And then, very importantly, what's going on with the consumption side of food? What's going on with what people eat? the demand side. And this larger system of, of, of view is very challenging because we're very good at decomposing and deconstructing these different elements and components, but then there's also thinking and work and research that needs to be done for the system as a whole so that we could see emergent properties of the system and think about changing very fundamentally the system itself. So what we're going to be um, thinking together about uh, for the, about the next half an hour or so is from production to the whole food system focus. And what I want to be pointing out is I'm going to be pointing out a lot of research challenges, both in the component parts and the system as a whole. So I'm hoping for the students who are here who are interested in taking up some of these cha research challenges, because we really need a lot of research in this new thinking of the system as a whole. So now I have to explain one thing before I go on. So what we're going to be um, thinking together about uh, for the, about the next half an hour or so is from production to the whole food system focus. And what I want to be pointing out is, I'm going to be pointing out a lot of research challenges, both in the component parts and the system as a whole. So I'm hoping for the students 
who are here who are interested in taking up some of these cha research challenges because we really need a lot of research in this new thinking of the system as a whole. So now I have to explain one thing before I go on. So I've colored, this is, I call this lecture in some ways like follow, we have something in the States called follow the bouncing ball. I don't know if you have that. But what I've done for the following slides, showing the research areas for these different, for the different parts of the components, is green for production and supply, blue for su supply chains, markets, and trade, and, um, and orange for the consumption and demand. So this is deconstructing it, but we also always have to be thinking about the system as a whole. Okay, so Justin mentioned that I've done um, quite a bit of work on observed impacts of production. So for, uh, 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 observed impacts of climate change. Now for many, many years also, the working group two of the IPCC was all about projections of impacts, and it still is. A lot of climate change research, in some ways, you could even sort of say it's not exactly science because it's projections, right? Science, the fundamental science is measurement of what is happening now, right? And understanding the processes that are happening now. So for the IPCC, I said for working group two on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, I said, look, we can't just be filling the whole, we call them the bricks, a thousand pages of projections, right? What we need to do is see what is, if climate change really is important, if it really is happening now, what impacts is it happening now? What impacts is it having right now? Now, then it gets into, in terms of the research, so you have to, in order to do that, you have to detect change. That's the detection part. And then if you are really going forward, going through the entire um, logical a chain of causality, you have to, if you can it be attributed to anthropogenic climate change. Because every climate change in the world may not be related to anthropogenic change. For example, the urban heat island is not caused by gre increasing greenhouse gases, it has other causes. So, when we think about looking at uh, observed impacts of, on production and the detection and attribution of it. Here's one example of some important research. And it's in, just in your area of drought. So you may be familiar with the work by Wang et al. Um, and so first, before you even get to the impact, you have to see, is the climate changing in this area or region or uh, in this particular way? So what Wang and his colleagues did was find, a, uh, for the climate change part, a drying tendency from 51 to uh, 2011, dominating, and then they just looked at the global grain production area. And you see an increasing in drought, increase in drought severity, a trend towards that um, for in their study. So that's the climate part. Then the next thing is, well, what's happening to the actual agricultural element. And here the impact is that increased drought severity, duration, and area was associated, and they, they did this all over the world, this is one example, with large crop losses in Africa and other developing regions. So that's the, an example of, when we go to policymakers right now, actually, uh, <laughs> I can't say much about the IPCC report, but just think about if you're going to be presenting something to 100 delegates from 180 countries, one question they would like to know is, is this climate change happening now and where? Is it happening in my country? Is it affecting my food supply? So this part and this, doing this kind of research is truly important for that stakeholder-driven uh, research. Okay, so that's, that was on the production side. What about on the supply chains? What about what's happening now with the climate change and trends that we've had so far in terms of the supply chains, markets, and trade? So here's an example of this. So on the climate change side, 
and this is over to my continent, the Western Hemisphere, um, North America, broad agreement, this is the climate part, there is broad agreement that human factors have had a measurable impact on observed oceanic and atmospheric variability in the North Atlantic. There's less confidence, you know, IPCC is very, very strict about you can't make a statement, you have to, you have to assign a confidence level to it. Medium confidence that this has contributed to observed impacts, uh, to observed increase in Atlantic hurricane activities since the, since the 1970s. So, this is, <clears throat> that's the climate part about, we call them hurricanes. I don't know, do you call them hurricanes? You don't have them really, I don't think. You have, but Storm Freya was just here. I guess a nor'easter, we call those perhaps. Anyway, so what about impacts there? Have, so, if you remember, last fall, there were, there were terrible um, uh, hurricanes um, uh, in the Caribbean and in um, the southeastern part of the U.S. So in the U.S. Caribbean, hurricanes Irma and Maria caused catastrophic damage to infrastructure as well as extensive damage to the region's agricultural industry. So see, you have the linkage, the climate change changing the um, the prevalence of the hurricanes, and it's actually the severity of them, and, um, and then the, the disruption of the agricultural supply chains and industry. Now, you see this, those two, these two examples right here. What do you see? What are they? They're from the media. <laughs> What we, need, what, I re what we need in the IPCC is we need peer-reviewed journal articles that are proving this kind of thing. So I'm just trying to plant some seeds here. I hope when I come back, then we're going we're gonna to say, oh, yes, here, here's, the, here's the new article that, we, that, that can go in the IPCC. Okay. Now, what about, are there any observed impacts on the consumption side, the nutrition side, the, the eating, the people eating side? Here, the climate change, and this is work done by the FAO. What they did was they did an analysis of countries, low and middle income countries that were exposed to climate extremes, heat, drought, floods, and storms, for more than 66% of the time. That's their index. index. And they did it in two different periods. And they sh they've sh shown that the uh, number of countries from, these, from uh, the 96 to 2000 to, has increased from 83 to 96% more recently. Okay, that's the climate side. Then, what about the impacts? Countries with high exposure to extreme events have more than doubled the number of undernourished people, that's the orange bars, and they're in fact adding 350 million more as those without the high exposure. And the, uh, the diamonds are the uh, prevalence of uh, undernutrition of under nutri in the countries in 2017, and that's the pr proportion of the population. So, I think that this study is very interesting. I think it's important. I think it's a little bit juxtaposing, um, you know, the climate extremes and the uh, it doesn't really, it certainly doesn't show causality, but it's trying. You can see why it's a challenge of research. How do you actually get to the effects on people's actual nutrition from the climate change that has been occurring? Okay, that's on the observed side. Now I'm going to go into the, that part about when I said all the projection side. So uh, here's the project, here's a summary of some of the studies and methodologies that have been used to project impacts of climate change on production. So what I like about this study, which um, uh, was by Zhao et al., is that it's a meta-analysis of, sev of uh, several different methods, which sometimes the methods are kind of fighting with each other. So I like it when it's, they were all brought together and uh, <laughs> the proponents of the methods have been sort of fighting with each other. And then they does it all brought together. And guess what? Lo and behold, pretty much the results are the same. So the, the take home point is multiple lines of evidence show climate change impacts on food production are projected to grow. What this is showing is um, 
temperature impact on the crop yields in percent, so for zero down two, four, six, eight, ten percent, and this is per degree C. And the, for example, wheat is showing three percent, and with uncertainty, three to 11 percent per one degree C. The methods that are used that went into this meta-analysis are process-based crop models. That's the kind that um, a lot of people in AgMIP use, but not completely. Um, some of them are done on point-based modeling. Some of, it, that, some of that modeling is done on grids. Um, some of it is, comes, which I like, from warming field experiments. What really lets you know you can actually put heaters out into the field and the plots and actually see what happens to the crops. And then the um, other method that's um, also very much in use is statistical modeling um, for what happens with uh, higher temperatures and yields. And those are um, based on um, observations of yield changes um, in current climate, but in different places around the world. So that's on the production. What about our other two areas? Oh, one more on that. <laughs> so sorry on this. this so this is, this is the meta-analysis. But let's look, uh, let's look at a global map of, what, of the, these, this is from the gridded crop modeling. So um, this is one of actually the first um, um, model intercomparison um, uh, studies that AGMIP organized. And the first, it was the first time really that more than one model was used to project with the scenarios of what would happen with climate change scenarios. And this for so this has seven, what you're, what, what's presented is a median of yield changes for seven global gridded crop models and five GCMs. Um, and what is important about this is that for the first time, it wasn't just one model making a projection and it's like everybody, oh yes, we start to believe it, right? When you have multiple models, you can then look at the median, but you can look at the, 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 the model-based error bars or um, uncertainty bars around that and characterize, at least in part, the uncertainty of the projections. That's been, what's been done a lot in the, um, in, that's really what the IPCC does with the uh, CMIP projections, Climate Model Intercomparison Project. And so we're very proud of this uh, work because it was the first one. You can't see it on this one that we chose because, with the explicit nitrogen stress. But in the, um, it, for the first time, the companion map to this had hash marks showing where 70% of the models agreed. So again, if you're saying to like the country representatives, this is what's gonna to happen to yield, don't you prefer, wouldn't you prefer standing up and say, all the 70% of the models say this, as opposed to one model saying, oh yeah, this is what we found with our model. So what, the, the results are not new. The, this result has been found in study after study that the lower latitudes, if you look, where are the yellows and reds, are more vulnerable to climate change. These results are comparable to earlier, but for the first time, they have much more rigor in the methodology. Okay, that's on the production, but hey, wait a minute. What about the supply chains and the markets and the trade? What are the projections for those? So. There hasn't been, I don't think, a lot of work. Please, if anybody knows any work, email them to me. Justin has my email. We're collecting, collecting all the studies right now for the IPCC for the land report. So when you think about it, climate change can be very disruptive to the supply chains for food. That's what all of this is. I won't go through all of them. You can see heat effects on the railroads, right, that carry, that carry the food, on the ports. The, et cetera. Coastal flooding and sea level rise. Also, the ports can be devastated by, in, by uh, exacerbated co co uh, coastal flooding. Heavy precipitation, flooding. This is, you, we, it's, everybody thinks in a way uh, for agriculture, oh, well, you know, precipitation is good. Too much precipitation is not good for agriculture. And you can certainly see on this part with the supply chains, it will be. So, you know, then this is about reduced delivery, safety, um, 
uh, movements of uh, economic goods, all these things can, you know, are just system reliability of the delivery of food. And that really affects the um, fourth uh, pillar of food security, the stability part. This, this part can be very, very disruptive. So the study from FAO is showing changes in agriculture, net trade, um, with, um, with climate change. So the, the yellow places are, um, are net uh, exporters, and the uh, purple areas are net importers. And then the bars are showing how the, those countries uh, trade would change with climate change. So just to, just to show what the big uh, projections are, the big changes are, is that countries in, for, in Africa and South Asia are projected to have a real reduction in their, um, their um, net exports. So, and the green countries are where their um, exports are, are are uh, projected to increase. So you can see right away, remember we saw in the map before, low latitude de where developing countries tend to be, negative effects of climate change? Well look, it's carried through even into the supply chains and markets and trade. Now, what about the third area on consumption and demand? And this is really, really new, this um, finding based on experiments, actually, on high CO2 experiments, and they collected all the data, and they did nutrition, uh, they did uh, nutrition uh, assays on the actual yield, on the actual grains. And what they found is, and this was very, very new, because for a long time, climate change in ag was, well, CO2 is gonna be great for crops. So, because of in increasing um, the yields. Um, just in and of itself. But what then, what is now coming out is that the protein contents of plants are, that is affected negatively by higher CO2 concentrations. So this is really changing a lot how we're thinking about how climate change will be affecting food. So what the graph is showing, this is work by Christoph Muller et al. from PIC, and um, he's uh, head of the GGCMI of AGMIP. Um, so this is in the current. We have iron, zinc, and maybe I have a, do I have a thing? Yes, I do. Iron, zinc, and protein. Now, with climate change, remember this was the bar chart that we looked at with the per, per degree C negative effect on yields, right? That's the red, right? If you only look at what happens with climate change, there's a projection of calorie production gap. When you put in the CO2 fertilization effect, it, it, first of all, it compensates for some of the calorie production gap, but, and this is the new part, each one of those elements with those micronutrients and the protein uh, for iron and zinc and protein decline. This is a very, very new and important um, set of studies that have been coming out recently. Okay. That was all on the impacts and adaptation side. Remember I said also it's extremely important, agriculture is extremely important because it emits greenhouse gases. So think about it. All the ways that food system releases greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So just to look at, first of all, um, uh, growing the crops, for example, with rice production, with the methane production, livestock with the ruminants, then land use, uh, land use and land use change, if you add that in for deforestation, for expansion of agricultural land, that has low and high estimates. And then adding in the supply chain, which nobody ever did before. Nobody actually, very, very few people have, and groups have actually looked at the food system and the emissions of, um, in, in total on its own. What the, one thing we're missing here, and that's why I didn't put the orange, is there is a certain amount of emissions also from all the cooking and, and all of that um, too, but that's not included in here. So if you add up all these numbers, and these are very rough and we are uh, refining them right now as I speak, if you look at the combined food system in this way, 
the estimate, the, the range of estimates is between 30 and 50 percent of total greenhouse gas emissions. This is, I think, enormous. Um, by the way, the food loss and waste is also extremely important. These are included in these estimates. Now, these kinds of exercises are very rough. You know, they're like all these kind of, again, it's a meta-analysis. These numbers aren't right. It's probably somewhere around 40. But, it's the, but when we're thinking about this system thinking as a whole, that, we're, that this contribution to greenhouse gases, the, the greenhouse gas challenge, really, and climate change challenge, from just food is, I think, striking. OK, what are we going to do about it? Let's start going to solutions. So for a long time also, the solutions for agriculture focused on production. That's what m most of these do. And they were on what we call the supply side, right? This is the production of the agriculture. That it's our, this is our green production and supply, our green balloon or ball. So the overall take home point is that supply side mitigation, and there's many, many things that agriculture can do, agricultural practices in the food system can contribute to climate change solutions. And, but how do you have to do it, right? You have to become more efficient so that you are producing more crops and more livestock per unit area and per right unit of input. So it's challenging to sustainably and efficiently intensify the use of land. And then also sequestering carbon in soils and biomass. So let me just read, I won't read all of these, but just to say, well, I'll just do the big ones. By the way, the red is the range where available. This is work of Mario Herrero, uh, who was for a long time in the CG system in Ilri. Um, and uh, is now a CSIRO in Australia. So carbon sequestration due to improved, let's look at the big ones. Let's look at these two top big ones for agriculture. And both of them actually are, are related to livestock. That's also because livestock is the biggest uh, emitter, uh, the livestock systems. Car this is carbon sequestration due to improved grazing management. So that's the pastures, improved pastures, improving the carbon in the soils there. This one is improved feed digestibility. That has to do is attacking the actual, it's like going to the actual ruminant uh, stomach situation, right, and, and all of those processes. And if you have better feed, then less methane will be produced. But there's, there's just, there's lots of them. I won't go through all of them. The point is that there's lots of supply side mitigation techniques that can be done. So when we think about, think again about talking to the countries, 180 countries, I, I maintain that agriculture is the primary sector of every country on the world. And they all want to know what they can do to contribute. So having all these supply side things is very, very important for all the countries in the world. But now I'm going to get to the one that's coming up more and more. And this is on the consumption and demand side, and this is what we call the demand side. Now, I know you have, you, there was, because it came out in England, the Eat Lancet study is very important, and this is really following on from this, that we're really taking on and in, in building in that same approach, that if we, and this is also thinking about this whole system approach, our system is so, locked in in some ways, but, or not maybe lock in is not the right word you're to use, but, you, but thinking about the system as a whole, right? what people eat is incredibly important because that's what people grow, right? So what if we change what people eat? And that's the real impetus for this demand side mitigation. So this is from lots of different studies here, some of the, um, some of the uh, people who've done them. All these different vegetarian diets in the notes under the slide, you can look them all up, what they are. They're all these different kind of combinations. Um, but you can see that the potential for changing diets, feeding back onto that production, that land use, 
has the potential to possibly, it's a little bit hard to say. By the way, this is, this is total, these are, again, this is why modeling is, it's good, but remember, modeling is like hypothetical assumptions. So this is like, every, these, these, uh, these numbers are assuming that everybody in the whole world takes on these diets, right? Which we know culturally won't happen for many, many reasons. Um, uh, but you can see, this is the su supply side potential, and there's the potential through diet to have a very big effect on the greenhouse gas emissions from the food system. So demand side changes in food choices and consumption can help to achieve global greenhouse gas mitigation targets and improve, and here's the part that now I just, I want to end on this part for here, which is improve human health. So what do people care about? People care about their health. And this, by doing this, it's not only that we're helping to solve climate change mitigation, but we are going to be addressing, we can address the health issues, not so much from the earned nourishment, that we have to still keep working on, but it is the 1.3 billion adults and 38 million children under five who are overweight, and the 678 million people are considered obese. It's incredible. And so you see the food system as a whole is not delivering health. If the food system were delivering health right now, these numbers should be zero. So this is, I think, when we're thinking about this kind of disruption to the way we're thinking about all of this, this is partly, this is in part why, we're, why it's disruptive. Now, of course, nothing is simple. One of the things that we get interactions with, with some of those mitigation factors that I just went over is that if you have to, if we really are trying for the 1.5, the IPCC 1.5 report came out a few months ago, if we're really trying for that extreme levels of mitigation, of holding it down to 1.5, warming down to 1.5 from pre-industrial, it is then we have to do things like taxing carbon emissions, and then these can have knock-on effects as well. The mitigation, when we're trying to solve climate change, it can actually cause food security issues. And this is why. If you tax carbon emissions, it can lead to higher crop and livestock prices, higher food prices. Land-based mitigation, that's when we're by, we, have to, we have to grow a lot of bioenergy, we have to have a lot of afforestation, right? It leads to less land availability for food production, lower food supply, and higher prices. Price in, Price increases in turn, and that's what this study is from. This is an AGMIP study from Tomoko uh, Hasegawa. And this is what this is showing. These are the mitigation effects. This is the effects from the mitigation itself on food security. And this is changes in the population at risk of hunger and the climate effect. So, you know, we, like, there's kind of like, in a way, no free lunch here. You know, we have to really be careful what we actually prom promulgate. I think that this is the uh, sort of the message from this study. So it can turn, reduce consumption, especially by vulnerable groups who price of food is very important to them. And it can sh cause shifts to less nutritious food. So this leads to, and that's what this is showing, the 2.6 is the, about the 1.52 degrees C warming. And you can see, that in Sub-Saharan Africa, India, China, particular, that these mitigation strategies or in, it, things it's like um, implementations could actually hurt food security as well. Okay, then on top of all this, food loss and waste. So this is also a very much a growth area, I think, for research. I won't go through everything, but in every, the reason, okay, we have all three parts of the food system. There's uh, food um, uh, losses in, they call, you know, losses in, is in the production and um, handling, storage, processing, distribution, and then in the consumption, it's waste. So um, there's carbon footprint, food waste, wastage, lots of things to do here. 
It's challenging. If we just don't throw away our food, is it really going to help? You know, how do we actually, I think, this is where I think the research challenge is. Everyone would agree, oh, we shouldn't waste food and, uh, you know, and have food loss and waste. But then if we really do that, will we really plant less area? And how will, that, how will it actually help us in regard to climate change mitigation? Okay, that was all the mitigation side. Then, of course, no matter what we do, the climate is already changing. Remember, we already did that in the beginning about the, the effects that are happening already. And no matter what we do, even at 1.5, even at 2 degrees, and of course, you know, it's still very, very possible that we're going to go beyond those, we have to adapt. And so we have to adapt our systems at the same time as we're working to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So again, I won't go through all of these, but this is all research areas. How do we optimize and scale up the current agricultural management and breeding practices? These may be some of the things that you're working on in the Brescia project. Uh, can we use agrobiodiversity? How? Soil organic matter management? How? Water conservation? How? To really adapt and what works, what doesn't um, across, across landscapes and, and uh, and different landscapes, but what lessons can be learned? We had a good discussion with Felix and his group about, you know, we can't, we can't just say there's just everything is context specific and we have to have a different uh, solution for every place. What can we as researchers do to really see what are the, what are the most promising, the most effective and go through? Of course, infrastructure hardening, that's what, like for example in New York City with the berms, et cetera, around the shipping. And then this one is very interesting, the, the uh, change in diet, not just as mitigation, we were just talking about it as mitigation, but then it's the potential for change in diet to also be adaptive. I call it indirect because it's like a reduction in demand. And again, if this really happens and it really gets going, we have less, we don't take up as much land, and then we, and we reduce our kind of surface area that we have to adapt. That's, that's the idea of a demand side adaptation. All right, that was the food system as a whole part. Now at the end of the talk, I just want to share with you a bit more about AGMIP. So very similar to Brescia, I, was, I looked at the, um, uh, the brochure and it's very similar to, the, the goal is very similar of, in the mission which is to provide effective science-based agricultural decision-making models and assessments of climate variability and change and sustainable farming systems to achieve local to global food security. So what is AGMIP really? AGMIP is a worldwide community of researchers, basically. Um, but of course, we interact with stakeholders a lot. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so we, these are, this is to prove <laughs> that it is a worldwide community. About every year and a half to two years, we have a global workshop. This is some of them. And we have lots of regional workshops as well. And we get together and they are, they, they are researchers who are primarily agricultural modelers in all the different aspects. So from the very beginning, it's not only focused on the um, biophysical, but also we've had uh, economists with us from the beginning. So just as I was showing you those multi-model uh, projections um, from like seven or eight, and now we're up to, of course, 10 to 15 global gridded crop models, we have the global economic modelers with us as well, and they're doing, they're exploring in a multi-model protocol-based way what do those uh, sh production shocks mean for the global uh, trade, for example? And then this was, this, this actually, I don't have the most recent one. The most recent one was last year in Costa Rica, but this was the one in Montpellier, France in June. Um, so I want to invite everyone who would like, who's feel, who does research in this field to join AGMIP, because it's really thinking about it, it's kind of a global network that your Brescia work is, could be, you know, is, is like a network of networks. So we're hoping to, uh, Justin and I are discussing how, how we can really, uh, you know, really work together in a kind of network of network approaches. 
So just to share a bit about um, some of the work that AGMIP does. And what we realized from AGMIP is that we, so there was a group that was doing regional work on crops and regional economics. And then there was the other group. I showed you the group of the high resolution gridded crop modeling at the global scale. And I just told you about the global economics. This is the one that was with nine global economic models, all showing, by the way, that the prices of agriculture uh, commodities will go up. And then, so we realized, hey, we have a matrix here. So we have regional, and this is the regional economics. So we have a regional part of the matrix and a global, and then we also have crop and economics. And so what we, what we, one of the things that we do, and this is what we did for the 1.5, the IPCC 1.5 report, is we do coordinated global and regional assessments. And I really think you've all seen many, many global pictures, uh, right? Maps of what will happen with climate change. And we've all worked on many, many, many case studies of what will happen, right? But it, think how powerful it will be, and it can be, if we can join those scales and learn from what does the global modeling say, and uh, do we, it's like also a, a kind of sniff test. Does this global grid really show what's going on, really do a good job or not on down in the ground? But we also, sh we also share, for example, global prices uh, to the regional prices. We do the linkages as well. Um, so it's actually um, in methodologically embedded the actual integration. But what I want to do just to end is just share, because it's so similar, I think, um, to what you all are doing uh, with, the, um, with the African colleagues who are here, is focus just on this regional side. And to tell about a project, also funded by UK DFID, um, uh, with, that went on for eight years with seven regional teams in these places. And we developed protocols for working together to do regional integrated assessments. And all of this is captured in two volume books and we're actually working on the third volume uh, th um, there, published by World Scientific. So, but here's the heart of the, heart of, of the methodology. First of all, it's stakeholder driven, just as we were discussing all morning. Um, and uh, so every team had a stakeholder engagement um, expert on the team from that country. And they organized the stakeholder interactions to really say, find out from the stakeholders, well, what is the problem? That was what um, one of the speakers this morning said. You have to see, ask, what is the problem? So all of it is, um, uh, stake, all of the work is stakeholder driven. It takes a farming system approach, so it's no longer just a crop model, it's the whole farming system. That's this wonderful little picture here, right, of the house and the crops and the livestock and all the different kinds of crops. That was drawn by the daughter of one of our, um, one, one of our partners there. Um, it's interdisciplinary, see how similar it is? Climate, biophysics, socioeconomics, multi-scale and multi-model field, farm, region, and global. Here's our global, um, linking to what's going on in the farm households, a survey based there. Um, and then taking this distributional approach across the landscape. So it's a landscape approach, not just really point-based anymore. And because of linking to the economics, we really are able to then get the distributional results and the impacts on poverty from this um, team approach and interdisciplinary approach to, um, to regional integrated assessment. So here is some, uh, just a couple of slides on the um, regional integrated assessment and the team. That's the folks on the left. And evidently, they, so they're pointing to, it's one of the graphs that they made, I think, that says something is getting better. That's why they're pointing like that. So the system that uh, they worked on, the farming system, was family farms, less than one hectare. These were growing maize, sorghum, and groundnut. 60% of the farms had livestock, primarily rain-fed, sandy soil, and very high food insecurity. And already, the observations have changed is that, that both min and max temperatures were, are already uh, increasing. These are the climate change projections. 
um, uh, that they were then testing in the integrated modeling approach. And this we call the stakeholder loop diagram because this is how we actually did the stakeholder interactions. Um, so there's background information and, and a beginning conceptualization. And then these are, the, these are, the, the, these are where the meetings with the stakeholders. So with the expert discussion, then you immediately start revising what you're doing. You do different model runs and it re results interpretation. Then you see what's going on with the, with the future representative agricultural pathways. Then you come back again and you say, okay, this is where we are now. And they say, no, go on, you have to do more. We have to, they said, it wasn't enough. <laughs> you have to be even, think even more creatively, think even more outside the box in terms of developing the farming system resilience strategies. So that's what this external revision is. See, they did the model runs again, results interpretation, and they redesigned the system. And then, actually, the national level got hold of it and said, oh, we want to hear what you're up to. And so then they, they took it all the way to the national level. So this is all about the process um, outcomes and uh, the stakeholder process. So then um, we um, also, the, we, there's someone, one of the um, colleagues from Africa um, is uh, as a communications specialist. So then we worked with communications specialists to, make, to create this kind of infographics around the results. Uh, we also have a, um, you know, a, like a, a, a web tool that you can, well, we call the Impacts Explorer as well. But, uh, and this is, by the way, focused on, we don't only do climate change, of course, because the, big, the number one question the, st the stakeholders ask is, what is happening now? So uh, this is how to improve practices today. And uh, what's interesting is, I won't go through all the results, but just to say, look when you get to the, um, the step three, and it brings in the market. So remember back to our components, the components of the food system. So as we're doing now our studies on regional integrated assessment, I think we have to open our, you know, open our thinking to include not just the kind of production thing that we would be doing a lot before, but really bring in, well, how, do, how does this affect the markets? Are the markets available, right? What are the supply chains? What's really happening? And then also, as we saw with the food insecure group of people that were in this study, what is happening with the consumption of the food, the demand for the food, the nutrition of the food? And I think that as we do that and as we um, and I hope we can maybe work together to really create this kind of full food system approach. So, to finish, this is the food system that we've been talking about um, throughout this, um, um, the, this talk. We see the impacts onto each one of the components, that, right, the climate affecting them, but at the same time, they, they, each of them affects the greenhouse gas emissions and the climate system itself. But each one of them has, as we saw, as we explored, mitigation and adaptation pathways that can lead to this, first at the planetary scale, planetary health and sustainability, that's the global scale, and then, but then when we go to our farming systems, just as we were looking at the one in Zimbabwe, just as I know you're working on many in Africa in your work, for example, we can really then see about how the whole system can be delivering nutrition, health, livelihoods, and well-being. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was really interesting. Thank really you. Enjoy that. Um, do you, uh, in the work that you do with your um, various models and group, do you also model the potential change in food demand type that may be occurring, particularly in relation to migration, um, where we see people migrating anyway, but also as we see land use change um, driven by intensification, of mm -hmm. course, people are 
that essentially results in um, a massive reduction in rural labour requirement, of course, right. uh, and moving people out. So you have you know, people leaving the land, potentially migration and changing, and, and, and coupled with this intensification potentially being driven by poor land, having poor land management practices because you're trying to very rapidly you know, fertilise a use, mm -hmm. um, can, can rocket. So you can get these two things in combination, um, driving uh, changes on the landscape where people are thinking in the medium to short term. How, how does that factor into yes. these approaches, or is that a, sure. something Sure. Um, so I gave a very um, um, telescoped presentation of, of the work in the regional integrated assessment. Um, so what that, if you're, the exact um, trajectory that, that you're proposing, no. But in the, in the methods that we've developed, we developed something called RAPS, which stands for, stands for Representative Agricultural Pathways. And the, the stakeholder process, you might have seen it on the, the looping figure. Um, it's really about, with the stakeholders, developing alternate scenarios of agricultural futures for their region that they know. And so, and those, usually, so I, I was, sharing with someone earlier, even though it's actually, and this, this kind of speaks to, is every place completely different or are there some things that we can kind of, you know, begin to, you know, sort of understand. Most of the groups in the different regions, for example, I showed in the, the Africa, they came up with two main wraps. One was a kind of, a, they, some of them, and they all gave them different names, but, um, the best way to describe it is gray road and green road. So the gray road was intensification, commercialization, larger plantations, et cetera. And then the green road, of course, was more sustainable. But none of them, so that, um, that process allows for that kind of thing too. But nobody looked at that. They did look at the intensification part. Uh, in those studies, um, we definitely many many of the different groups did look at that. Um, but this idea also of, you know, maybe two things combining—that's what we should we should really you know think about that as we as we really think about developing wraps further. Thanks, Cynthia. It's a very interesting talk. When, um, when Johan Rockstrom came up with the planetary boundary concept, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it was quite interesting that um, you know, the, the pushback on it a little bit was from parts of the world who kind of said that actually improving our access to resources will minimally affect the planet. Um, and, and that pioneered sort of Kate Rayworth to come up with the Oxford Donut and sort of social justness. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, and, and, and I think the, you know, the global food system's broken, as you kind of highlighted in the Eat Lancet Commission, kind of um, highlighted. But w one of the interesting things is it's probably broken most in places like North America and the UK, and yet we principally talk about Africa uh, and other countries. I, I just wondered what your thoughts were on how to disrupt the North African and UK system whether, whether it's the same way forward or, or whether that's going to require a different approach. Right. Very challenging. You see, I think we're just at the very, very beginning of all of this, of really, really thinking about how to disrupt the actual systems. And I think it absolutely has to be done in carefully, really. Although, you know, that's one of the things about disruption is that disruption is not done carefully. But when we think about it, and that's why I'm said about how, how you know, culturally embedded food is everywhere. And also, not, it's not only culturally embedded, but it's also embedded in power structures. Um, you know, this is going to, you know, you know just having an education campaign, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe. Maybe that's the beginning, and I think that beginning maybe has already started, but 
I think, yeah, I'm, you know, maybe I'm just, you know, again, just have thinking, uh, you know, to the, you know, the challenging question you posed. You know, maybe we need to identify hotspots of these kinds of nexus, like, like here's, here's a place where this is embedded. I think what you're saying is there's, there's this very deeply embedded um, food system pathway almost, right, but for Europe. Is that, I think that's what you're describing. So maybe what we need to do is identify around the world, well, where are some of these like, key places that if we were to really, you know, I agree, glo you, know, you, can't, like, you can't really address this globally. I mean, at the sort of this high level, conceptual level that I was presenting today. But then, what, where are these places that it is very deeply entrenched? Many of them are coming from North America. Absolutely, very, very strong, huge things, you know, in terms of the way that the food system actually works. I think identifying some of these systems and then having research around them to say, okay, what would it really take? What does it really need? And, you know, if we're going to do it with, and it, you know, we're all saying, stay, everybody's saying stakeholder research, include stakeholders in, in what we do. Well, then you have to get the agribusinesses right there, right? You have to get the businesses who are controlling those supply chains, right? As well as thinking about the demand side. So that's why this thinking, I think, is, is really helpful to begin to, it's sort of, this is like high level thinking to begin to see, okay, how do we really go about actually learning how these could change? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, there are issues that are affecting people across the, uh, the globe, climate change. Um, I was looking at one aspect, uh, uh, biofuels uh, versus uh, growth value index. I'm looking at Africa where there, there's talk on biofuels and how would farmers allocate their land between cash crops and uh, yes. food crops. Yes. I think that's one of uh, the contentious issues as of today. Um, in the same vein, um, I was thinking of uh, the issue of intensification, expansion versus uh, bring efficiency into the production cycle. Uh, also, these are some of the contentious issues in African context. Mm -hmm. Then we have the issue of uh, foreign agriculture investments where yeah. countries are investing in a second nation to produce what they mm -hmm. need to import in terms of their food right. needs. Um, these are some of the issues I was trying to find out from your experience. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, so, cash crops and food crops this in, in Africa, um, this expansion of agricultural areas, land use change, and this, the, foreign, the role of foreign investments. You guys are asking very tough questions. <laughs> um, all right. So, See, I think this approach that I think that I think that what Brescia is and you and Brescia are working on, and kind of you can see that in our different project and AgMIP, this kind of approach of working together, creating these potent, you know, talking with the people there, right? I mean, creating it absolutely there, and then creating this kind of scenario approach, then allows not only the research to be done of what does this actually mean or and with the context of climate change but with all these other pressures on the foods on the food system itself and then through that interactive process I believe this is the hope of the and the theory of change right um, that by by undertaking these kinds of projects very deeply really very deeply I'm just thinking, maybe we can do this for the Europe and the, the North Africa um, you know, hotspot we were just talking about. This is what it actually takes. This kind of very deep, long, and actually long-term work, it can't, it can't be over too soon, in which you can then explore with your research, with the stakeholders, but, but with a research inter interface, what are, the, what are the actual implications of cash crops versus um, uh, versus food crops, 
And by using models, which we, I think are great tools for integrate, you know, interacting with stakeholders, and then you can look at, and that's why I'm so, because with some of the, the uh, colleagues here who have land, you know, who really use Clue and land use models, we don't have that in AgMIP yet, but we really need to have that. It's like the landscape scale type of modeling. And, um, and then, you know, maybe then addressing these kinds of food system and foreign, this like foreign investment and into and the supply chain uh, approaches. So that's what I would say. I mean, I think you guys are really, you know, very much on the, it's, you know, that's what we're coming to too, very independently, this kind of work. Hi, Cynthia. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm a, a social scientist and not a modeler, um, but I'm, I guess I want to problematize the concept of demand that I think you're using, uh, because from the work that I've done in um, looking at agro-food systems, I can see that markets are made mm -hmm. and demand is manufactured by a whole complex set of you know, education, mm -hmm. price setting, um, you know, pacifying, making a product, the problem of... You know, I do a lot of work on the meat industry. You've got a massive carcass of an animal, and you've got to somehow find a home for all the bits of the carcass. So how can we make a home for that little bit? Mm -hmm. um, and so when we think about how we're going to change the food system, I guess I particularly work in kind of the you know, European context with, I guess, relationship to the North American context, is how to think about how we're going to make those changes. I think, we, you know, I'd, yeah, I guess my work doesn't fit into the modeling uh, box very easily, but we've got to find new ways of talking about it to enable people to feel empowered mm -hmm. that they can, you know, working with the big corporates, you know, and I'm excited that more conversations I have with people that many of them are actually thinking about how to reduce the amount of meat. They are. For example, yeah. you know, McDonald's are kind of interested in that or mm -hmm. working how to make carbon neutral production systems. Um, but again, it's about making new kinds of markets, isn't it? Yeah? Yes. It's not the simple, it's a demand issue. It's about a whole new kind of assembling of, of the world of food in a new way. And we're doing that the whole time, you know. I mean, my students are really into kind of protein-rich foods at the moment, you know. Yeah, so. <laughs> absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. And that's really what, when I was trying to say that it's like, you have to think about this, that's really the whole system thinking. So that you pull apart the components, but really it's much, much more than that. And I completely agree with you. And I think there's, um, you know, mod modeling is just one tool for some of it, but not all. And I think clearly the social science part of it is absolutely huge to really see, well, how are we going to actually modify? And what are the levers, I think? What are the levers of modifying the system as a whole? So that then when we come back, you know, like let's say 10 years, 20 years, what, you know, would we, what, how would we describe the food system in the future, right? And, and, it's, and its health aspects. But I agree with you, I think as you, with your work, and I think you said that you're working with some of the big, big food agribusinesses, and I think they, definitely have this on their radar screen because they know that instead of being a like calorie or food delivery system, they have to now, they have to change and deliver health. And I do think that's percolating, but I think, I think there's just a huge amount of work to do to actually work it out. So thanks very much for that, for your comment. Thank you. Can I add my congratulations to those already expressed? I think you've given a superb lecture on a very timely topic. Can I then ask a very naive question? Sure. In that <laughs> I hope I can you've answer. talked about food. I'm also reminded of drink. And I'm thinking <laughs> particularly of H2O. Yeah. Because with the number of the models, it seems to me that the two wouldn't necessarily be synchronized. Mm -hmm. And therefore, is... Um, drink or H2O, right. something that is integral to the models you've described, or is it something that would be much more in parallel and almost duplicating the sort of approach that you've described? Right. Well, fantastic question. So in AgMIP, we have a water uh, team, uh, and um, 
So uh, one, one thing is, there's a couple of answers. One is in AgMIP itself, we have a water team to, to uh, really uh, build on and enhance and do work on the water food uh, uh, nexus, I guess that's uh, to use a kind of current term. In, of course, many of the agricultural models, there is a hydrological cycle built into the model. All the crop models have it with rain, infiltration, runoff, uh, evapotranspiration back out. Um, and uh, so some of the models have a uh, hydro, it's like their own mini hydrological cycle within. We also work with the water MIP which is a model intercomparison of large-scale uh, water, um, water models, global hydrological models. And then uh, some uh, there we have, and some of our AgMIP researchers have then taken the water MIP results and our AgMIP results and then explored the consequences of, for example, well, we say for an adaptation, we'll, we'll put on irrigation, right? But you have, to go to a, <laughs> you have to go to a water bottle to see whether that water will be there. So we do take it into account, but I think there's much more, there's, I think, great scope for integration with food and drink. And just, that's something, because Justin is a jet specialist and a hydrologist, well, we're, we definitely are talking about ways to do that. <laughs>